All right, guys, we've come to the second part of our conversation about the big picture of Scripture. Uh, we're just backing up and looking at the landscape of the Bible. Let's begin with a, a little creative exercise. I don't know if you're going to like this or not. I but, like exercise. Yeah, 10 seconds, draw the person, your best picture of the person to your right. Go. 10 seconds. 10 seconds, Ten seconds. maybe 15. Okay, 15 seconds. I can't even see his face. Jeffrey, I'm drawing you like Picasso style. You're going to see. <laughs> uh, I I I'm doing know. your hair right oh, now. Oh, man. James, our friendship. Jeffrey, you got 10 David, seconds. I'm sorry Jeffrey's about over your here nostrils. like painting a... Our friendship is... Sorry about your nostrils, here. David. No, don't even worry about it. Okay, that, that's Time's like... Time's up. Time's okay, up. Time's okay. up. Time's up. Time's up. Oh, that's actually pretty good, Jeffrey. Okay, is it the Here's reveal? David. That is really good. <laughs> Here's Look David. Look at me. That is, you in, wouldn't know. But you gave, him tie, you gave him your lips. Michelangelo. I in an me. unusual this sort of way, right that here. is me. I only got the lips right, and that was even close. Is that James? <laughs> that's okay. Close. That's Look, close. I just got the lips right. Just the lips. That's all. Oh, what's going on with yours? I did yeah, the pop the art thing. One. I have a little program here that'll allow me to sort of... So Jeffrey's very angular. Is that you? Yeah. That's a mirror right there, my friend. Okay, no so artists at like the me. table. No artists at the table. Absolutely. But, but think about it, guys. <laughs> no artists <laughs> no at the artists table. No artists at the table. Clear. Listen, listen. you got to give me more time. I'll, I'll make We're going we're to address things. another very simple, basic question. Okay. What and who is God? Okay. What and who is God? Mm. I mean, you just drew a picture of James. James drew one of me. A picture I drew that one. is ostensibly of me. Yeah. I could. I guess you could say that, that the picture I drew of you approximates the identity of David, but it comes nowhere mm. near actually communicating the totality of the full package that is David. Got right? It. It's mm. a character. It's, it's good. It's it's something that comes short of the reality. We're going to look at what is God, then who is God. And I think we're going to discover that for sure he transcends anything we can imagine. Mm -hmm. so, so just so I can be clear on this, the purpose of the exercise then is basically to say that's an approximation, that's an approximation, that's an approximation. Yeah. It's nowhere near the reality. And so too, in a similar way, many of the things that we would think about God or that others would think about God are just approaching what God that's really right. is. Mm -hmm. These are one-dimensional Okay. Images. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just flat, one dimension. Even if we did our very best and we had artistic skills and we were to draw out the features, if we were to then move from flat one dimension to clay or to stone and fashion an image in the Bible called idolatry, we would not be approximating what and who God is. Okay, so I want to just jump ahead here. Maybe we'll come back to this point, but I don't want to lose it. And that is that uh, you just mentioned idolatry there and you mentioned image kind of all in the same language. And I heard somebody say several years ago, actually a good friend of all of ours, Nathan Renner, and I, Pastor Nathan Renner, I loved what he said when he said that the reason that God is so averse to making images of himself, you know, you will not make an image like mm. me, no images, no idols. And I thought this was such a great insight. He said, because God has already imaged himself oh, yeah. in mankind. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, yeah. so when God sets out to say, hey, this is what I'm like, it's not a golden calf or a stone statue or any other... It's not it's a not picture so, on no. paper. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's a living, breathing, intelligent... I know this is skipping yeah. slightly ahead, but, yeah. mm -hmm. but that's a good starting point for us, mm -hmm. that yeah. these terrible approximations that we've got here, these caricatures, are, mm -hmm. are crass. They're not even close. They don't right. even begin. And that's what an idol is. God says, nah, I'm not, I, that's not me, and that don't... That's an insult to you and to me. I think there's a sense in which we, we can say things about God that get nowhere close, and it's just outside of our intellectual orbit, so to speak. And there are things that we can say about God that are absolutely, concretely, fully true. And okay. we're going we, I mean, mm -hmm. to talk about this, but I think that in the course of the conversation, we'll discover both. The question is divided into two parts. What is God, then who is God? Mm -hmm. So, what is God? What? In other words, yeah, the nature that. of God. When we say what is God versus who is God, we're talking about the nature of God versus the character of God. So, the difference between what is a human being and who is Jeffrey Rosario. Yeah. 
Okay. That's a good illustration. So let's, well, can I kind of start? Go for it. We good there? Well, first of all, our, our first conversation was about the Bible, and we talked about how the Bible is a story mm. and it's a love story. In my view, and I think that we would all agree with this, there's really kind of two ways that God makes himself known to us, what we might call general revelation mm -hmm. and special revelation. Now, what, what I mean by general revelation is this idea that it's a revelation of who God is and what God is that's generally available. Nature, our own intuitive sense. This is something that you don't have to have a Bible. People down through the yeah, ages yeah. have had pictures of God. Mm -hmm. They've known there was a God. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of that picture. And that picture can be sometimes accurate, sometimes clouded, like you were just saying. Mm -hmm. But then special revelation is God's yeah, word yeah. to us. He's saying, mm -hmm. okay, that's close, and you're on the right track there. Oh, you're way off there. God knows that because we see through a glass darkly because of the nature of, mm -hmm. because of, the nature, of nature, uh, that is to say it's fallen, God says, okay, so here, here's how I am, mm -hmm. here's how I mm -hmm. interact, here's how I relate this. So this is special revelation. And, and if that's the case then, yeah. then who and what God is, our textbook is going to be God's revealed yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. word. But in in the word being his revealed expression of who he is, I think if I can drop a verse, there's, it's important to acknowledge the limitations. Yeah, for sure. Because by definition, God, hmm. d there's mystery in that. Of course. By definition. Lots of mystery. Yeah, so yeah. for Even example. Even with the special revelation. That's what I'm, God. well, it's from the special revelation that we're reminded. Yeah. Oh, this is remember, a mystery. Remember, sort of like Moses by the burning bush, take your shoes off because you're on holy ground here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But in Deuteronomy 29, and verse 29, I'll just read this mm. here. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament, right? Yep. Fifth, Fifth book, book okay. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. There's an interesting verse here that is, is very important for us to always keep in mind because if we don't understand the parameters, then we can cross the line and, oh, I love and enter verse. into mysterious. Okay. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed mm, belong mm. to us and to our children forever, mm. that we may do all the words of this law. Mm. There are things we don't know and... And that's okay. Can't know. And that's okay. Would you say can't? Yeah, there are things I would we say can't, can't yeah. know. I heard an illustration, saw an illustration one time. See if you guys agree with this. If, if you draw a circle and that circle you say, we drawing. say, yeah, <laughs> represents the whole universe, okay, we'll just put a U there, and the universe itself is composed of, you know, we have space, we have time, we have matter, and if you that circle... You just spelled the word must. Oh, I didn't, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so, so if this circle represents the totality of created reality, all of reality, the whole universe, and we ask the question in relation to that circle, where is God? Okay. The answer would have to be outside of the circle. Yeah. Because, because God, his nature, what God is, God made all of this. He can't be, yeah. he can't exist within it if he was the creator of yeah, it. Well, he, he can't it, exist he within it, but it, but it has to be something that he, he himself, transcends. he right. can choose to go inside, yeah, yeah, right. he which can is what scripture into reveals. into yeah, the circle, right. he can come in to communicate with us, but, but I like to say it this way, that God is, is not present in all nature, but present to everything. So this omnipresence idea, God is present to us, but he's not in everything. That's, that's pantheism, pantheism, the idea yeah. that God yeah. actually is composed of the totality of the material reality. I mean, we could go so far, the Bible says, uh, in two scriptures, I think of the one in Titus chapter one, for example, you could put in the circle time, right? right. It says there that God did this and this and this before, before there was time, time began. Before right. time began. So time itself is a created reality. God made time. So he has to transcend it. Yeah. God's eternal. He transcends space, time, matter, he, he, he transcends all of it. So you're mm -hmm. saying a lot there. I, I've got several questions I want to ask, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding or maybe I am understanding. First of all, when you say that God is present in the universe, no, excuse me, that God so, is present to the universe, but not present in, in terms of being a part of it. Right. 
Are you talking there like in terms of what you might call adjacency? Yeah, adjacency. So like I'm present I'm here, to David, but I'm, I'm Jeffrey's there, but right. we're different. But, but you're I'm not, not inside David. of Jeffrey. God is distinct from what he's made. Okay, that's, that's the point. That's the point. Okay. He, he is not what he made, right? So, so when we ask... So, so now let me just okay. quickly pause there. This is exactly what Genesis says. I mean, the opening verse of Bible makes this illustration right here clear because it says, in the beginning God... So this, there isn't this. Yeah. In the beginning, oh, that's God. that's an excellent point. So there's yeah. the, created this. That's right. So you have adjacency so and you have differentiation. he pre, mm -hmm. predates that's right. that. That's right. But there's another point he made that I think is really powerful too. Okay. He said that God can at any time step into that. Yeah. Now, if you read Hebrews chapter one, and that's, uh, there's a couple of verses here that are really powerful, but the one that I'm thinking of is verse three. That's yeah, funny because in our first conversation, we read verses, didn't you one take us to verses one and two? Now we're in verse yeah, three. Now Let's verse three. And, and the question we're, we're, we're talking about discussing is what and who is God? So here verse three says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So the sun, so we talked about as in um, Jesus. Yeah, we talked okay. about specific, special re revelation. revelation. Got it. This would be special, specific revelation. This is this is God Himself stepping into. You you looked at this again, and you you saw that that God is out here. Here is creation. God now in in the person of His Son, He steps into creation. Absolutely. And everything we see in the Son mm. is mm. God. Who is God? Yeah, yeah. Well, look at Jesus. The, yeah. Another verse that comes to mind along those very same lines, and again, maybe we're just jumping the gun slightly, but it's, is it Colossians 1, around verse 20, where Paul says that, that in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I think at this point, if we're sort of, in my mind, we're moving through in a systematic way, what, what our point up to this point is, that God is a being that is mysterious just by his very nature. Mm -hmm. And he's also a God that is not, he is not the universe. He, he is not made the universe. The universe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, think about it. I'm a created being. You're a created being. We have certain, a certain range of perception that is limited to what we are. We right. can't know what is outside of the orbit of time and space. For example, when, when, when a person asks the question, what is God? I have to say, I don't know what God is because the what question, you could say it this way, what is God made of? And immediately the language falls. The language is not sufficient mm, of course. for the thing. What is God made of? Well, he's not made of anything. He is. Yeah, and in the beginning, God. It doesn't. It doesn't give any other explanation. Oh, it assumes, no, that's a great point. It assumes he's already there. The story begins mm -hmm. with he's there. The the language so. for that right there. The language that philosophers use for that is that's what's called a first principle, mm -hmm. or or a basic reality, basicality. It's the idea that this is assumed. It's this, irreducible. It's, it's irreducible. There's no yeah. uh, first cause. Yeah. There's yeah. It, in the beginning, God. Okay, that's declared now. Who is, and scripture spends infinitely more time, I'm just speaking, you know, figuratively here, a lot more time on who God is and comparatively little time on what God is because we lack the intellectual capacity yeah. to even grasp, but what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you talk to me about, you say, oh, there's my friend, his name is Mark, you need to meet Mark, he's a really nice guy. Okay, I have a picture in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mark has two arms, he has two legs, he has, I can get a general picture of Mark even if I've ever, never met Mark. If you say, what is God? Well, what image do I get in my mind? Well, as we've already said here, the, the closest image that we have is... Jesus. Yeah, let, well, yeah, and human beings. Let oh, us yeah. make man in our, in our, in our image. image. Yeah. That and as it, James read, Jesus is the, like the fullness the of... The express and, image. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that God... It, it's the point that it's making there and let us make man in our image is not primarily that God has ten fingers and God has a nose and God has ears. I'm not denying that there's a physical element to God's mm -hmm. uh, uh, reality because the Bible reveals that. But it's saying things like mankind... Adam and Eve were moral beings. Yeah. God is a moral being, yeah. discerning yeah. between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, mankind is an intellectual being. God is an intellectual being. Mankind is a, is a creational being. He creates. God is a yeah. creator. Volitional. Volitional. He can choose to do things. Mm -hmm. Mankind, God said to them, uh, exercise mm -hmm. sovereignty over the Garden of Eden. God is sovereign over the universe. Mm -hmm. Emotional. We're emotional beings. Exactly. That should tell us something about God. 
so it is in this sense, in mm -hmm. this moral sense, that we are made in the image of God. Now, there certainly are pictures in Scripture mm -hmm. of of God as a physical reality, but I think we would the eyes of the Lord run the to eyes and of the Lord, the, the finger earth. of the Lord yeah. Yeah. Uh, wrote, you know, on tablets of stone, the Ten mm -hmm. Commandments. But that's not to say that God is confined by that physicality. But like He can go into the earth, He can manifest in these physical ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's incredible. I have often wondered in my mind um, how long God existed, for example, and then immediately I say. I don't know, and in the next moment I say, wrong question. I can't even, how long implies time? Your brain just begins to wobble. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, how long? Well, he's existed forever. What does that mean? Because to my mind, to your mind, that in, involves days, weeks, months, years, you time. It. Yeah, it, it involves time, and God transcends all of that. In some significant way, God transcends the very things that we take for granted and mm. that help us to make sense of reality. So you've probably heard this proverb before, a little sort of a riddle, but I think it's quite clever. And, and the question is sometimes asked, do fish know that water exists? Mm. And the answer to that would probably have to be no, right? Because if a fish is, especially like imagine a deep sea fish, it's born in water, it lives in water, it breathes in water, its mm, whole mm. reality is water. Mm -hmm. The only way it could ever really know what water is by way of comparison would be to experience dry. Yeah. And then to come, oh, so this is that and that is this. Yeah. So for us right now, just try to imagine a world without time and space. We can't. You can't because yeah. you're stuck in know. time. This is your reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at that level, this is why the verse that you read us in Deuteronomy 29 is so powerful. The things that are revealed, they're for us and our children. Yeah. The things beyond that, those are the Lord's. Okay, we got to push the pause button and take a break, but this is a great Already, man, I felt like we were just yeah, warming yeah. up. I I'm loving this, and uh, we're going to come back and just launch right into who is God. Yeah. That there was some definable picture of God in God his existence, who is literally the kind of person. I don't know how anyone can believe in such a God. Not too long ago, I had a super interesting encounter on a flight out of Denver. As I took my seat and began reading whatever book I happened to have with me, it became obvious that the guy sitting next to me was looking over my shoulder and catching a few glances of whatever it was. He must have saw the word God or some religious terminology because rather casually, the guy leaned over and he says, looks like an interesting book. But then after a short pause, just bluntly out of nowhere, the guy says, but I'm an atheist. Well, evidently he was an outgoing guy and looking for some conversation. So I said, actually, I'm an atheist too. Clearly he was a little surprised, no doubt because of the book I was reading. He was like, seriously, you're an atheist? Yeah, absolutely, I told him. Then I threw him an unexpected curveball. I said, describe for me the God you don't believe in. He was jolted, to say the least, by the question. But I knew that there was some definable picture of God in his head that gave rise to his atheism. But he went silent, so I figured, conversation over. But then after thinking for a moment or two, the guy opens the conversation again, and he says, you know what I mean, a super powerful supreme being presiding somewhere in the sky that rules over us with absolute control. He paused again, and then he just plowed forward, man. He just let it all out. You know, before we're born, this God decides who gets to go to heaven, who's going to burn in hell forever. Of course, we have no say in the matter because he's Mr. Almighty God. It's his universe. So how dare anybody question him? He can do whatever he jolly well pleases. Well, he was on a roll now, doing a great job of defining his atheism and mine too. It's all utter nonsense, he went on. And we're supposed to love this tyrant? 
I don't even like him. And I'm pretty sure that liking someone has got to come before loving them. It's more like a monster than a God. I was right with this guy, I have to tell you. Just right with him. Yeah, I totally agree, I said. It's, it, it's, it's a pretty diabolical picture, huh? Yeah, he said, I don't know how anyone can believe in such a God. Me neither, I agree. I certainly don't. I don't believe in the existence of any such God as you've just described. But I want to ask you another question. I mean, hypothetically, just for the sake of discussion, what if a God, the exact opposite of the one you've just described, could exist? Would you want him to? He was jolted again, just, just thinking about the idea. What do you mean, he says, like what? So I offered a totally different picture. Well, what if a God could exist who is nothing but total goodness, perfectly just, perfectly merciful to everyone all the time? A God who always does the right thing toward every person. A God who would literally give everybody total freedom to decide their own destiny and never in a million years torture anybody who didn't agree with him. Now, what if a God could exist who is literally the kind of person who would rather die than commit an injustice against any person? I mean, if a God like that could exist, would you want him to? Now, I could see that this was totally new territory for him. But after thinking for just a few seconds, he said what any rational person would have to say. Well, sure, he said. I'd be a fool not to, right? Yeah, right. I agreed with him. Then he said, but, but no way, man. We can't just manufacture whatever God we want. And I agreed with him again. No, we can't manufacture whatever God we want. But he was listening, so I elaborated. Listen, man, I totally resonate with your atheism because I find many of the popular views of God as repulsive as you do. But I believe that the one and only true God is beautiful in the extreme. And you've said that you would want that kind of God to exist if he could. Well, I simply do believe the very thing that you want to believe. So you're not really an atheist, he says to me? Well, actually I am. I'm an atheist in the sense that I don't believe in the cruel, tyrannical God you've just described. But I do believe in God. But I believe in a God who is nothing like the God you don't believe in. So as far as I can see, you haven't rejected my God because the fact is, you've never even considered him. I'm asking you to believe in a God of sheer beauty and perfect goodness. And I totally commend you for not believing in the false God that you were raised to believe in. I mean, this guy's mental wheels were turning. And you know what? I found that many people who don't believe in God don't believe in a particular picture of God. A self-serving, threatening tyrant who wants to either control us or damn us. They reject the only option they've ever been taught. While somewhere in their hearts, they desire a God worthy of their love and worship. I mean, what if? What if the God who does exist is nothing at all? like many popular religions portray God to be. What if God is love in the strongest and most beautiful sense imaginable? What if? What is God? That was, that, was a great, that was a great conversation. We need to make the transition now from what is God to who is God. I think the bridge there is probably, I think all of us would agree, 1 John 4, 8. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the three most powerful words that mm -hmm. any human being can ever take to their lips. Mm -hmm. It is the most definitive statement regarding not only the character of God, but also the nature of God. Mm -hmm. Let me this read is, it. This is it. Can I jump in there? Yeah, okay. do it. First John 4, 8, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The thing that I love about this statement is it has such explanatory power because it's the only statement in Scripture that purports to describe the entire identity of God, the total identity of God. Everything else that is true of God is true of God by virtue of the fact that God is love. Which, I mean, is, you a, which is amazing when you think yeah. about it. When you think about what we've just talked about, described, all of creation is in this big circle, and then you've got God outside the circle. You've got everything that we can ever imagine and, and stuff we can't even imagine. And so you're trying to describe the being that created all the stuff in the mm -hmm. entire universe who transcends all of that and stands outside of it, and you're trying to describe that being, and you can do it in three words. Three and, be <laughs> and be accurate. And be accurate. inclusive that's of deep. everything. Yeah, that's yeah, deep. yeah, yeah. So some people... But, but wait a minute. The point here is, you say that's deep. The point here is that word love. Yeah. To be able to say God is love and capture everything says a lot about that word as well as the fact that it describes God's And it doesn't character. say God is loving. Yeah. It's a noun. Yeah, it's God yeah. is love. He is yeah. love. He's, he's love personified. Because love is so cheap. Love is so insignificant. I love Talk the way you... I, yeah. And yet God is love. Yeah, yeah I love tacos. So the yeah. word has been cheapened. Yes. You're right. Yeah. yeah, it's been reduced to basically something that's been drained of its meaning in our culture at least. So what does the Bible mean? But that's, yeah, that's God a modern love? phenomenon. Yeah. We can't take our modern version or versions of what love is and apply it to the God is love exactly. sentence. Exactly. What does that? Here's that's the idea then. Here's yeah. the idea yeah. then. That's, that's an equivalence. equivalence. Yeah. So if, we need to know what, we, we're, we've talked about what this part is, this God thing. We, we say we don't really know what God is, but now we, what, okay, so what is that thing? What is love? That's the point. I mean, think about it. If we're actually trying to understand what God is and God is love, our journey is not just trying to discover what God is. It's also trying to discover what love is, yeah. what true yeah. love is, yeah. what is love. And you is can only any, define that through God. Is there anything that's true? Well, that's true? John's point. John says, if you don't love, you don't know God because you know, that's the thing that God and is. And the thing that everybody sings about on the radio, the thing that all the yeah, movies are yeah. about, everything is about trying to figure out the love thing. Yeah. But the world is trying to do it without first visiting the definition, which is God. Yeah. God well, in, God the, in the culture that. in which the statement is written, God is love, John chose a very specific word that was not in vogue in the Greek vernacular. It was a word that, that, that was there. Imported. It was, yeah, it was, it it was, was for this. Basically, the popular word for love at the time was eros, from which, from which we get words like erotic. It's aesthetic love. Mm -hmm. In other words, I love you because of what you do for me. There's something, maybe, maybe I like the way you look, and so mm -hmm. I derive pleasure from your appearance, or maybe I like your talents because they entertain me, or maybe I like you see where I'm going with that? That sounds a lot there, like our some, world right now. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I love you because you're of value to me. So really what I'm saying is I love me and you're the channel through which I'm <laughs> focused on myself. It's an economic right? love, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's economics. But I word, love you as long yeah. as you keep me. Some, mm -hmm. If you're contributing something to yeah. me, then I like that. I love that. Yeah, but what if that winds down? Yeah, what if I get What if I get tired old, of the novelty? Old ugly? What if... What, what right. if I'm no longer aesthetically pleasing. Which takes us to the biblical definition of love. I mean, God is so love. That's, We've looked at that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The biblical definition of God actually, of love, actually takes us to a fuller understanding of God. First Corinthians chapter 13 yeah. has this, it's a whole chapter on yeah. what is love, but it has this one little center that really mm -hmm. focuses in. Let me just read these verses in second, or First Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 4. Love is, so God is love. Love is, I'm going to put in there God is. Is that okay? Sure. sure God yeah. is, God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. God is, does not dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That's a gospel right there. That is That's just a beautiful. gospel right there, beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
So in reality, you can look through the Bible and every time the word love occurs, you can just replace it with the word God and well, vice versa. You'd have to probably be a little bit careful with that. In other words, you, I don't mm. think you'd want to make Not an absolute every single, statement. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. Wait a minute. We just we almost lost something there. We began by saying there was a Greek word yeah, that that's the apostles what I wanted to, that's what chose I wanted not to, to use. In yes, fact, the word eros. eros, which was the popular word like love, yeah. like I love tacos, I love my wife in our culture, and there's just no distinction. They deliberately chose not to use the popular vernacular, mm -hmm. eros. Mm -hmm. They chose a word that was not in common use, and that word was agape. Agape is, I mean, I don't know what's the best way to describe it. It's unilateral love, I guess. It's, it's God loves you, God mm -hmm. loves me because of what God is and who God is. It, it's not conditioned. Dis disinterested love, maybe. Disinterested, yeah. 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 It's not dependent Selfless. on Selfless, something yeah. that's being derived from you. So, so if, you, if you fail, God's love doesn't turn down like a dimmer switch in the mm -hmm. dining room. If you succeed, it doesn't turn up. He doesn't ever love you more because of the good things that you do or less because of the bad things you do. God is love. For him to stop says. loving you, he would need to cease to exist. Stop being who he is. Yeah, or completely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this verse is, but is, there's a verse that says God cannot deny himself. Yeah. Yes. Isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll look it up. It doesn't here. mean self-denial. It doesn't mean God isn't self-denying. It means God cannot deny who or he go contrary is, yeah. to the reality of who he is. To his character. That God is love and he can't deny that reality. He'll mm -hmm. always act in concert with it. You know, can I, can I take us down a different road related, related to this concept of God is love? And it goes back to the beginning in Genesis. There's, there's a very, very interesting concept here about the plurality of God. Because in Genesis uh, chapter 1, the first verse just says, in the beginning, God. And then it describes God's creative activity. But when you read verse 26, there's like a curveball. And, and, and it's connected to this idea of God being love. It says in verse 26, Genesis 1, it says, then God said. Let us. Yeah, let us. It says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Wow. So somebody's talking to somebody. There's yeah. plur there's, that's obviously, that's those the are all plural pronouns. Right. But, but it says, then God. Singular. Which seemingly, seemingly singular. singular and it's then, Elohim. It's not singular. And then it throws this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's is, why I say seemingly singular, because yeah, in the English, yeah. it's mm -hmm. God. It's in the singular. Yeah. But the, the Hebrew there is Elohim. Right. Which that I don't know what the proper language is for that, but it's a it's it's God introducing himself the first time in Scripture and basically through the usage of that name kind of speaking to us and saying there's there's more than one and yet there's one. Yeah, it makes sense because if God is not self-seeking, if God is love, by definition, there has to be more than just the one. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, Elohim is used some 2,000 times in the Bible to represent God. It's yeah. used in Genesis. It's used in Isaiah 6. You know, God says to others, who will go for us? Hmm. And Isaiah says, well, I'm here, send me. I mean, it's used over and over again mm -hmm. to designate yeah, yeah. more this selflessness, this this other-centeredness. Yeah, yeah. I think if I could just, Ty, you've been drawing here, so let me just make a quick drawing. If you can just imagine this line here down the middle of the paper represents pre-creation. I'll just write pre here, and then I'll just put here post or after. So this line represents God by himself, quote unquote, yeah. over here before creation, before those first four words of the Bible, in the or first few words, in the beginning God created. And then over here is after he started making the earth and making angels and galaxies and stars and suns humans. and moons and humans. So, so here's God over here, quote, by himself in the, mm -hmm. the pre-world. And it's true that God is love here, just as it's true that God is love here. God is not right. loving, which is what he would become after he made mm -hmm. something upon which to bestow his love. But he's mm -hmm. more than loving. He's love mm -hmm. in his very nature and in his very essence, which means then that there had to be some object upon which yeah. to bestow his love, some object toward whom he could not be self-centered. There has to be a receiving end. That's yeah. right. And that object, according to what we're seeing here in Genesis 1, which is why he took us yeah. there, is found within the very nature of, of God, God himself. 
himself. So, mm -hmm. so God is introduced to us, we would say it this way, and this is one of the beautiful, most beautiful pictures of God. In fact, it is the most beautiful picture of God of all the competing pictures. And that is that, that God is a family. Mm. Yeah. He, is, he is a plurality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These mm. three coexisting together in a selfless reality of other-centered love. Mm. Yeah, yeah. When I was in Thailand teaching at a university one time, the teachers took me aside and said, you know, you need to understand that 80% of these students are Buddhist mm -hmm. and they don't believe in the existence of God any kind of third person kind of being that's separate from what we are. Right. And um, they said it's not really going to work if you just start quoting the Bible. The Bible doesn't mean anything to them. So I began by just asking them. I said, I just want you guys to chat with one another, and mm -hmm. I just want to ask you a question. What is the most important thing in life? What's the most significant thing in life? go and they just started chattering in their own language and they were laughing and then I stopped them and and said so what's the most important thing well they joked a little bit video games you know whatever TV funny stuff and sure. then I said okay seriously what's the most important thing in life and every one of them said family friends or relationships every mm -hmm. single one of them at that point I simply said wouldn't it be strange if the very thing that you intuitively know is the most important thing of life turned out to be fundamentally disconnected from reality as a whole. What if you are by nature a relational being and ultimately you're headed for a non-relational future? What if, on the other hand, you hail from a non-relational past? Just merged with the cosmos, came out of the cosmos, immediately it began to make sense to them that, wait a minute, I'm relational, so reality itself must be fundamentally relational. 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 And that was, it was just a very easy bridge to go straight from there and to say, well, let me read one Bible verse to you and see if it makes sense in that context. John 15, 15, where mm. according to this text, God became human and said, I want one thing from you. I want you to be my friends. Mm -hmm. They were saying throughout the classroom, is that God he's talking about? Yeah, God says, I came all the way from mm -hmm, heaven to earth mm -hmm. into your world because I want to build a relationship with you. And we were off to the races after that. They were so, so engaged and wanted yeah. to know what else does this book have to say? I love about the God? idea and it's so true. Not only did those students in Thailand understand it, understand it every human being understands that at its most fundamental nature, at its most fundamental uh, mm. basic core, reality is relational. That's what mm -hmm. makes life beautiful. It's what makes it meaningful, important. That's what reality is about. Mm -hmm. Think about Facebook here just for a moment. You know, Mark Zuckerberg makes his billions of dollars. But how did he make his money? Not by creating a social network, but by creating a means by which to access something that was already there. Mm, right. Yeah. He just gave us a modern mechanized way to tap into something that we all intuitively want. We yeah, want yeah. Mm -hmm. to be connected. And, be, and, and what we're learning here is the reason that we long to be connected is that God himself within his own nature mm -hmm. is a connection. He is a family. He is a relationship. And he made us in, in his, image. his image. That's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. So incredible. Mm -hmm. You read Genesis chapter 1, mm -hmm. in the beginning Elohim, that mm -hmm. is in the beginning love. In the beginning, a mm. relational God existed and then created everything. What about John 1? Mm. Mm. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, with God. God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning mm. with God. If you do just a little bit of editorial sculpting, oh, take yeah, yeah. out some of yeah. the words, with, with, basically with. within the quote marks, the scripture says, in the beginning, God was with, with God. God. That's I right. mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any mm -hmm. sense for me to say, hey, you guys, I just w want you to know that yesterday I was with me. Because, because, you're, a sing no sense. because you're a singular being. But that's you right. could say, yesterday I was with my wife. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. And you are both Gibsons. That's right. But you are two persons. Isn't that incredible? So how do you feel about that, the word God being equivalent to our last name? It's the family. Well, that's what David is yeah, saying. Yeah. It's God's family so name, So it's right? the family name. The yeah. word God, Elohim, Elohim. Elohim is, is the equivalent, name. is the equivalent, mm -hmm. that's probably the safest way to say it, is the equivalent of our family. Yeah, that name. makes yeah. sense. I couldn't introduce myself to you and say, please meet you, I'm Ties, 
Right. That would make no sense because I'm a singular person. But as David was saying, there is a plural dimension to Ty's reality. Ty's married to a girl named Sue. We have three children. Together, we're the Gibsons. Mm -hmm. So there's a plural name that's applied to my social reality in the inner circle. So of that's why we distinguish between we don't believe in three gods. We believe in, and how, maybe how do you feel about this, one god three persons. That, that's a simple summary. That's exactly. Yeah. We Love believe it. in well, one God I think God that is the safest way to say persons. it. That's so a good, yeah, that's a good point to pause on, though. And I hate to keep doing this, but we have to pause, you have and we pause get to come button. back. Digma videos are short, engaging messages designed for opening up discussion with individuals and groups regarding the character of God, as well as for your own personal spiritual growth. For your free DVD sample collection of Digma videos, call 877-585-1111 or write to Lightbearers, 37457 Jasper Lowell Road, Jasper, Oregon, 97438. Once again, for your free DVD sample collection of Digma videos, call 877-585-1111 or write to Lightbearers, 37457 Jasper Lowell Road, Jasper, Oregon, 97438. Simply ask for Digma DVD-1. I want to begin by asking what is a bit of a trick question. I want to see if I can lure any of you into this uh, to, to the wrong answer that feels like the right answer. Okay, we're talking about what is God and who is God. And here's the question. Is it good news that there's a God? I would have said yes. But Until you said it was a trick question. David, you gave it away. Until he said it was a trick question. Yes. Do you know what the yes. trick is? No. So, so no. Here's I'm going to say yes just because I, think I, know I don't what know what is. this trick is. Okay, unpack it. I, I think the trick is, is it good news that there is a God? Well, it all depends on the character of that God. That's the mm. answer. There could oh. be a diabolical tyrant, it's a little and bit it like, wouldn't be good news. It's, this is the way I like to say it. It's a little bit like asking the question, is it good news that there's a husband? Right. Makes sense. Well, that totally depends. I mean, <laughs> what kind <laughs> of a husband are we yeah. talking about? So if the picture that we've yeah. painted here in the, mm -hmm. in the first two parts of this conversation, if this picture is true, let's just, let's just take a moment and breathe and say hallelujah, because if this is true, this is the best good mm -hmm. news mm -hmm. imaginable. Yeah, mm -hmm. If the universe is built around this kind of a being, yeah. oh, hallelujah. I mean, yeah. this is really, really Big incommunicably good mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, love The that. universe love is that. friendly. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been talking about the fact back in Genesis that God is a plurality of being, that God is a relational mm -hmm. being. One thing that I've, I've found to be really enlightening in Scripture is to ask the question, okay, so what was God doing in that relational environment before going back we to this, existed? Yeah, this picture. Yeah, that picture. So what's he doing over here? What's going on? Is God, mm -hmm. is God actively engaged in anything? There's just three verses all throughout on this. One is Isaiah 42. And right, verse right, 1, mm -hmm. and this is where God the Father what is verse was speaking. That? Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 42 1. verse 1. Mm -hmm. This is where God the Father is describing an aspect of his relationship with the Son. Mm -hmm. Jesus is prophesied of here is the Messiah who's going to come into the world, and the Father is telling us who this is to him. And he mm -hmm. says in verse 1, Behold, my servant, mm -hmm. whom I uphold, mine elect one, in whom my soul delights. Yes. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. so, so when God is describing the one that he's sending, the one that's coming into the world, he says, I just want you to know that this is one in whom I delight. This is the one in whom I take great pleasure, great relational pleasure. There's something mm -hmm. going joy. on between the Father and the Son in which, could we say it this, this simply, they enjoy one another's company. Mm -hmm. There's something going on there that's relational and mm -hmm. it involves delight, mm -hmm. okay? The second scripture I wanna to bring to your attention is in uh, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse seven. This is also the father who's doing the articulating here about the son. The son is gonna come into our world and he's going to be the savior and sacrifice for mankind. And God is describing that horrible, painful experience that Jesus is going to undergo. 
And he says in verse 7, Awake, O sword, God the Father speaking, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Mm. So God just describes Jesus as my companion. Mm -hmm. One version says, the one who is close to me. Another version says, my intimate friend. Mm. So, so, mm -hmm. so this, is, this is phenomenal if you think about it. This is, this, is, this is like, you know, you're sending your child to a foreign country to be received by people on the other end. And you're saying, mm -hmm. now, I just want you to know that the one that I'm sending you is my friend. I love him. I love her, my son, mm. my daughter very much. And this is the nature of my relation. I said I had three. Yeah, Here's the third, say, what's one. the third one. Okay. John chapter 1, verse 19, where the Bible describes Jesus' point of origin. Mm. He comes out of a certain place. And the word that the scripture uses is, it says that no man has seen God at any time except for the one who is in the bosom of the Father. Mm. So Jesus lands on planet Earth from where? The bosom from of the, the bosom Father. Of the it's Father. 18, verse, verse 18. 18. Okay, John mm -hmm. 1, verse 18. From the bosom of the Father. This, this, is, this is language that is describing the kind of relationship that mm -hmm. we're talking about in Genesis 1. Now, I just want to make a question rather than a point. You, you say this is the origin of the Son. Does that somehow infer that the Son had a beginning in, in, in existence? Oh, absolutely not. I'm, I'm referring to He comes to earth. Okay, got it. So He came from somewhere I to I knew that earth. that's what you meant. Yeah. I just wanted that yeah. to be clarified yeah. because the very point that we're making here mm -hmm. is that if the Son is not somehow co-eternal with the Father, right. then there would be a point at which you couldn't have said God is love. Mm. Right. There would be an isolated singularity rather than a plural relationship. Okay. Yeah. I like this verse in John 17. Now, the whole of John 17 kind of builds on this theme, this idea of that oneness and unity, and even, in a sense, refers to it mm -hmm. pre. But verse 10 says, and I'm reading NIV of John 17, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Oh, that's, yeah, that's mutuality. What's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. And then he says, the glory has come to me through them. In other words, or, or excuse me, and glory has come, to, has come to me through them. In other words, God is speaking here about not just possessions, like material possessions, but he's yeah. talking here about attributes. his character, his attributes. Yeah. Everything that I have, you have. And all my attributes. Yeah, all my attributes you have. And all... And, and it's the same thing in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 brings yeah. out the same idea that, that Jesus was, well, let me just read the verse because I don't want to just, just uh, misquote it or, or misstate it. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. And begin there with verse, what, 5, I think it is? Let this mind be in you? Is that yeah. where you want to begin? Being that's in the, the one. form of God. Yes, that's it, right there. Okay, read, so those, read, it. read those verses, Jeffrey. Five down to what? How far are you going? Seven. I'm looking at uh, verse five. Just, just five, Let six, and seven. this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Hmm. Yeah, and the, the thing is that's so beautiful here is who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. John 17, all that you have is mine and all I have is you. So when, when Jesus empties himself of his Godhead, of, mm. of, of, mm. of, of divinity to in that sense, to become a man, he's not abandoning the person of God or who God is but he's revealing more of yeah, who God yeah. is. Mm. Yeah. Because everything that I do is you and everything you do is, is mm. me. So God is revealed yeah, yeah. in this. I love verse this six there Christ. where it says, it's, it, it's actually a little awkward there, the language, who mm -hmm. didn't consider it robbery to be made equal with God. But mm -hmm. the, I think the simplest way to understand that is that Paul is saying that Jesus didn't even have to consider trying to take or steal Godhood he because it. he already had it. Yeah. It was... His. It was not yeah. something to be grabbed. It was something, in terms of his divine attributes, to be let go for the purpose of reaching us where yeah. we are. That's, a, that's another yeah. story, but it's part mm -hmm. of the story that God does this because you know, he loves us I've so much. I've been parked at John 17 here, but I've been waiting for this point here because in John 17, it goes, I think it flows very naturally with what mm -hmm. you've said so far. It says here, let me find it now. Verse 24, I hope. It's verse 23, even oh, better. Oh, okay, okay. 
It says, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and here's my point, and have loved them as you have loved me. Yeah, that's got to be one of oh, so, the astounding. So when you're talking about this companionship, this intimacy, this mm-hmm. love between the Father and the Son and, and surely the Spirit, that's good news for humanity because mm-hmm. Jesus comes to this world to, to declare that that intimacy, that love, that, that companionship mm-hmm. is being poured mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. humanity. Uh, and not only mm-hmm. to declare beautiful. it, but to demonstrate and to, yeah, yeah, that's right. I thought you were going to do verse 24. You've got to do verse 24. Well, let's do 24. Well, do verse, 24. verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me. There's that with concept with. again. With me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you gave me, you have, which you, you have, given, have me. given me. Now, here's the part. Mm-hmm. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's what right we've been. So if we ask the basic question, mm-hmm. hey, Jesus, uh, what were you doing before you came to this world? And going back further, what were you doing before creation? His, his simple answer would be, I was... In fellowship with my Father. Yeah, I was loving the Father. The Father was loving me. And he syncs that we up doing. in verse 26. I have made you known to them and continue to make you known in order that the love, the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So the there, love, there, the it love, the love. there it is again. There it is again. The love that exists between within. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the Father, we're talking about the Son. David mentioned the Holy Spirit earlier. Mm-hmm. So, so we've, got this, we've got this social unit. God is a communitarian type being. Family. He's a God family. God is a family. Okay. So, so you've got God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What do you guys think of this idea? Um, I was thinking this through and thinking, well, why three? What do you think of this idea that the number three really is the minimum numeric value of love? Okay, I gotta process that. Explain it. Three is the minimum numeric, numeric value, value of love. love. So far, so good. Keep Relationally, going. because think about it. If there's just one, love can't occur. We've already established that. that. Go in the bathroom, lock the door, spend your whole life there. You can't experience love. You gotta you can't come love out and relate to loved. somebody. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's other centeredness, as James read in First Corinthians thirteen. Okay, so you can't experience love as a singular being. Got but it. then you add one person. Now we got two. Yeah, it seems there, like you could have love. You could, but, but there's not. an exclusive attention. You know, I love you and you love me, but watch what happens. Have, did this happen to any of you when you were exactly in school? I know exactly where you where were Where you had a yes. best friend. I know yes. exactly. You had a best friend and a yep. third party was introduced into mm-hmm. the relationship? Yep. Yeah. What does that third party introduce? Now it's necessary for my love to be exclusive and divided. Mm. I need to have a selfless quality Mm -hmm. to my love with you that is perfectly happy with you loving somebody else. You're deferring. Mm. Isn't that something? No, 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 I love that. You know, up to recently, up to recently, it was just my wife. Just me and my wife. Yes. And uh, Mm. you recently had a child, did you? Not quite, but recently we've, we've included a third entity a teenager into our into our family mm-hmm. and so I totally resonate with that it's changed the game yes it's this is changed huge. the game this is huge married yeah. couples yeah. child comes along it yeah. changes the game yeah. we were on a school here at a, a rise and we have had many instances and this is something that you would have seen in your own experience whether in high school or college or whatever mm-hmm. but we will sometimes see when the the guy develops the the interest in the girl and the girl for the guy as long as that's healthy and it stays social and it stays mm-hmm. open, that can be good. But we've all seen those relationships where it becomes so doting mm-hmm. that it's just the guy and the girl, and it's as if the mm-hmm. the, know, rest the rest of the, of the world, world doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in a sense, t- tell me if you think there's something to this. That If that was all that love was, I mm-hmm. understand it for mm-hmm. a short time, I get mm-hmm. that, that itself becomes kind of selfish mm-hmm. because I have your completely undivided attention, you have my completely undivided attention. So what Ty's saying is, Three is the, how did you say it? The minimum, minimum numeric, numeric value, value of love. Because yeah. you introduced now a third part. And now, mm. and yeah, I, think you're, I think you are exactly yeah. onto something. I, I, this is probably, it is, I think, an evidence of the truth of Scripture. Yes. Mm. The Bible conveys this idea that, that God is a relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. And, and that bears testimony to the fact of, oh, this is... This is an inspired text. This mm-hmm. is you wouldn't this have made that up. God. No, you wouldn't have made that up. If, if I'm not hmm. mistaken, uh, Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis said something like this: that the the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is either 
the greatest farce ever invented mm. or the greatest truth ever yeah. revealed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, now, if, if this is what reality is like, no wonder we are so wired for relationality. We yeah. long for yeah. it because yeah. God himself We have his fingerprints on our souls. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the way to do it. You know, an, another thought on this, just building on this, John 7, verse 39. Yeah, it's okay, but especially John... 17? John 7, 39. Oh, 7, 39. Okay. And especially uh, John chapter 16. Oh, you're talking about the Spirit. Okay. Talking about the Spirit. Yeah. And how Jesus promised the comforter of the Spirit, but not yeah. until he was glorified because when the Spirit comes, John 16 specifically, Specifically, the Spirit is going to come specifically to glorify me. Oh, that's oh. other-centeredness. That's right. other-centeredness. Yes. Now, now yes. check this out. We just read John 17, and the whole mission of Christ mm. was to glorify the, the Father. Father. So Jesus yes. is on the search to glorify the, first the Father. To the other. Yes. Each and first every to the time other. you hear about pre-creation and through the life of Christ, the Father, what is He doing? Hmm. He is magnifying the Son. Yes. Listen to Him. Made this point. He, I'm well pleased in Him. Yeah. This is That's my right. Son whom I'm well This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well so pleased. each one yeah. continues yeah. in this. And yeah. you, you know, you see the Spirit. I mean, to me, okay, we think the essence of love is <laughs> God giving His Son. And then we think the essence of love is the Son dying for... But look at the Spirit. Yeah. He's standing in the yeah. background the whole time, just standing there. Stand, and in a sense, Deferring. just waiting to just, just come with a mighty rushing wind. Yeah. And just, I, yeah. Ty, are, you get, are you getting the feeling? Oh, oh I get it. it. Ty said something the other day. I loved this when we were doing uh, one of our Sabbath school commentaries. He said that the job of the Spirit, Scripture says that the job of the Spirit is not to talk about Himself. When mm -hmm. He comes, He will glorify me. He won't <laughs> speak of Himself. He will speak of me. Jesus mm -hmm. says this over and over again in John 14, 15, and 16. So He says, if the Holy Spirit held a seminar, it, it would be, be all Spirit. about Jesus. Yeah, it wouldn't, it be, wouldn't be a Holy seminar. Spirit seminar. Yeah. It would yeah. be a seminar all oh, about Jesus. Oh, this is so good. We have n just merely seconds left. And we've, mm -hmm. we, I just feel like this conversation yeah. is just yeah. starting. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good thing that we're going to continue the conversation then. Amen. Because uh, as, as one Bible verse says, uh, God's love is mm -hmm. oceanic in one version. Mm -hmm. it's, it's huge. So Good way to end. Yeah, we're going to continue this good conversation. Bottom line is, in answer to the question, what is God? Basic answer. Uh, we, we don't know. We don't Outside fully, of our intellectual we organ, know. we don't know what God is. Bottom line answer to who God is, mm. God is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Glorious good news. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that, David. If God is love, ultimately, everything's going to work out and the universe is friendly in the end. And we're mm -hmm. headed somewhere really beautiful and really great. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's the bottom line. God is love. Mm. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Love it. To purchase the complete Table Talk 13 part big picture series, visit us online at lightbearers.org or call us toll free at 877 585 1111. Once again, to purchase this Table Talk series, call 877 585 1111.